Welcome to Innovation Guelph Presents Toolkit Tuesday. Today's session is all about social media influencer campaigns, with influencer marketing being a billion dollar industry, experiencing rapid growth right now. It's a form of advertising that can be extremely beneficial to your brand. But what exactly is it and how does it work? How can it elevate your brand? Did you know that there's a Canadian company focused on helping brands connect with Canadian micro-influencers? It's true, let's call them bold. And before I introduce you to today's speaker, the CEO and founder of Embold, I have a quick few announcements. Today's session will be recorded and posted publicly on Innovation Guelph's YouTube channel. We ask that you turn off your mics for the presentation, and if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box below. Jordan will be monitoring the conversation today and will pose your questions to Umar, our guest speaker, when we have the right moment to do so. And during the last 30 minutes of today's session will also be an interactive Q&A component. So to experience today's presentation in American Sign Language, please pin or spotlight Umar and both the interpreters, Laura and Danica, to the top of your gallery. In addition, anyone in today's session can access the Zoom closed caption function by clicking on the closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen. A quick self-introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Mickey Campo, a program manager at Innovation Guelph, and I'm super happy you're all here today. I'd like to just take a quick moment to thank our corporate sponsors, ISU Software Corporation, Merexis, OKR Financial, Reese Informatica, Invest in Guelph, and of course, BDO. We are so very grateful for their generosity and support in everything that we do. In addition, I would like to acknowledge and thank Sign Language Interpreting Associates of Ottawa for providing ASL interpretation at these Toolkit Tuesday session. So quickly, before I hand the screen over, I'd like to briefly introduce Innovation Guelph to you. While many of you on the call today are clients and mentors, partners and supporters, there are quite a few of you on the call today that may not know too much about us. Um, so Innovation Guelph will be 10 years old this year. We're celebrating a birthday. We are one of 17 regional innovation centers in Ontario. And while we're located in Guelph, we actually serve the entire region of Southern Ontario. And we do have one national program. So that means that while most of our clients are relatively close by, we do have clients in BC all the way through to Nova Scotia. We're very proud of the work that we do with our clients and uh, the support and guidance that we offer them throughout the multiple stages of their growth and development. So I'd like to share a little bit about our presenter today. Umar Tazim is an entrepreneur with a passion for impact through technology. Through his journey so far, he has become an experienced marketer, sales professional, and product manager, and now founder. Currently, he is building Embold, the innovative platform we are here to learn about today. It allows advertisers to connect with micro-influencers and run highly targeted campaigns. With over 4,000 influencers, advertisers, can now reach millions of Canadian customers and engage them with original content. So Embold works with advertisers throughout Canada, USA, and Europe to help them reach new Canadian customers. So without further ado, over to you. Awesome, thank you, Mickey. I'm just gonna uh, share my screen as well. Give me one moment. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and I'm uh, really excited to be here. Um, before I jump in, uh, I'll just give you a quick intro uh, to myself and to Embold. Um, I started Embold in, in 2018. Uh, at the time, I was running another marketing company. Uh, I was also studying at the University of Calgary and uh, while running that company, and uh, we were we were primarily focused on helping uh, local businesses in Calgary uh, reach their customers online, and uh, we were focused on the social media space. But not, I did, and I didn't really know what uh, influencer marketing was at the time. And uh, you know, influencer marketing was something that kept coming up from my clients, and every time I was trying to help them out with it. We were always coming across uh, the, the same issues or we were seeing the same trends. We were seeing that uh, there was a lot of uh, agencies in this space. And while uh, influencer agencies were really great, uh, they primarily worked with larger influencers. And uh, 
one of the things that we'll go into later is that larger influencers have a really broad audience. And so it wasn't very, it wasn't a very effective way for, for us, uh, my, my clients who are local businesses to go about promoting their business to them. Um, and they were also quite expensive to work with. Uh, then we went and signed up for some influencer platforms that were in the market. And uh, while from a technical perspective, they were really great and, and advanced, uh, they had uh, limited Canadian influencers and they were also primarily enterprise focused solutions. So with those two things in mind, uh, it felt like we had a we found a, a gap in the market that uh, that we could explore and that we wanted to jump into, and so in 2018, uh, I launched uh, Embold as an agency, and so uh, we we signed up a few influencers in Calgary and Edmonton, and uh, we started to go to some local businesses and uh, uh, and got our, our first client. Uh, it was a home builder in 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 Calgary, uh, and they were launching a new community, and so. Uh, we, we, we ran that campaign and as we started to get, get some more traction from, from other clients, uh, you know, that was some of the validation that, that we needed to, uh, to understand what, uh, what this market was. And, uh, and, you know, before starting this, I was also in the same position that, uh, that, uh, some of you might be, which is, I was like, wait, what, this is actually a market. <laughs> I, I, this is not something that, uh, I, I, I really knew a lot about. And so um, in this call, I'll just be going through in through like our, our journey, but also more about how influencer marketing works, how we work with influencers to help you better understand if this is something uh, that can work for, for your teams or, uh, or just to understand influencer marketing as a whole. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an intro into influencer marketing, uh, influence, uh, really the core of influencer marketing is that it allows, uh, it allows your business to use unique individuals, so like everyday people that are built engaged communities online to go and create and distribute content on your behalf. That's also the most unique thing about influencer marketing because, for example, whether you're going for like traditional uh, advertising such as newspaper, radio, uh, or a more, uh, or like the newer wave of advertising, which is going to be more like social media ads and, and Google ads and so on. Um, usually you're going to be paying for the content creation separately, whether it's your team creating it or a professional team creating it, or, and then you're going to be paying for the distribution by itself as well. Whereas Influencer marketing is very unique in that sense because uh, th these individuals have already built these engaged audiences. They know what it takes to go and, and engage their audience. So uh, not only are they promoting your brand, but they're also going to be creating the content. Uh, all the most of the content that you're going to see in this presentation, these are our, our influencers that have gone out and created content. So uh, you know, it, it's most of the time it's going to be shot by a photographer. It's going to be edited. Uh, and it's really high quality content that their audience is already used to seeing. And so when they see a piece of content, when, when a consumer sees a piece of content uh, from our campaign, they're going to see this as, uh, oh, this is someone that I know. Uh, and this is the type of content I'm already used to seeing. It's not going to be uh, something that's like a lot of like bolded text and messaging and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be uh, a really unique organic piece of content that's going to be talking about the brand or the or the product or the service that we're we're looking to promote. Um, just to give you uh, some some more insight, this is how we view uh, or how we go about explaining uh, the key benefits of influencer marketing compared to some of the other advertising methods out there. So um, when it comes to the different media channels. Uh, most of our clients are either doing Facebook and Instagram, they're doing some display ads or uh, some of the more traditional TV advertising. Um, and the key benefits for the traditional advertising will be the reach. Uh, and for social media advertising will be uh, the reach targeting and how easy it is to use. Uh, and for, for influencers, it's going to be that it has very high engagement. In fact, most of our campaigns will outperform 
paid social media ads by three to four percent. Uh, this is because again, we're promoting through their trusted network. Uh, and this is not just for, for Embold, this is gonna be standard across the industry uh, because on average, your paid social media campaigns uh, will have an, have an engagement below 3%, sorry, below 1%, whereas your, uh, whereas an influencer campaign, a micro influencer campaign will have an engagement of uh, three to four, maybe up to even 5% engagement on each campaign. Uh, some of the other benefits for influencer marketing are uh, the original content that's created and the organic reach. Uh, how we measure the success of every campaign is going to be uh, some of the uh, ROI metrics that are used across the industry are, uh, they're, they're at the bottom over here. So there's uh, CPE, which is cost per engagement, CPM, which is cost per mile. Essentially what that means is what is the cost to reach a thousand people? and then uh, uh, CPC cost per click. So those are the three different ways you can measure uh, the success of your campaign. Um, and so for us, when it comes to influencer marketing, we're tracking for engagement, we're tracking for reach. And then more recently, we've started to track for conversions and clicks and, and some other things as well. Uh, on Facebook and Instagram, uh, they make it very easy for, for you to go and track uh, your campaign. So you can do all three, you can do uh, cost per engagement, uh, cost per mile, and then also cost per click. When it comes to more traditional media, uh, it's going to be more uh, display ads out, out of home. Advertising will give you uh, an estimated uh, CPM, or cost per mile, and then um, more traditional media will give you, uh, like, again, CPM on TV and radio ads as well. Uh, some of the limitations with each of these different methods uh, for, for Embold or for influencer marketing, when I started Embold, we saw that campaign management was a really tough thing. Uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of advertisers stayed away from influencer marketing, <clears throat> because um, when, it, when it comes to running a campaign, there's so many moving parts. And if it's an individual doing it by themselves, it can be really, really difficult. And also finding influencers is tough as well. Uh, whereas when it comes to some of the other methods, um, like on social media, uh, the engagement's gonna be lower. Uh, if you're gonna be creating content through a production company, you're gonna be paying for that. And also uh, the, the biggest thing is gonna be that there's, the, your reach is only gonna extend to as far as you can pay for it. And so uh, the moment you turn off your ads, your, your reach is gonna be, your, your reach is gonna cut off, your campaign is gonna cut off. So. Uh, those are going to be the biggest things. And uh, for some of the more traditional media, they're expensive. Um, it's hard to target uh, and it's also harder to track. So those are the, the few things that we look at and some of the things that we assess for our clients when we're looking uh, to help them understand which is going to be the most ideal fit for them. Uh, when it comes to determining that, there's a few things that we look at to see if, in fact, influencer marketing is something that uh, could be ideal for uh, our clients. So some of the things that we look for uh, is who is the audience we want to reach. And if this is something that uh, that influencers also want to promote. So uh, right now, for example, for Embold, we're focused on the Instagram platform. Uh, we are expanding to TikTok, YouTube, and later on to LinkedIn later this year. But Right now, most of the influencer marketing uh, as an industry happens on Instagram. And so, uh, and the audience on that is primarily going to be under 50. And uh, so when we're working with advertisers, we like to understand who is the audience they want to work with, work with and who is the audience they want to reach. And if, if it is an audience that is within this demographic, then this is something that we will take to the next stage and explore a little bit more. Also, uh, influencer marketing is ideal for B2C clients, B2C brands, who, uh, and as a whole, who are looking to reach a younger audience. And so uh, these are the few things to, to look at and to consider uh, when it comes to deciding if uh, you want to explore influencer marketing for, for your team. Some of the other things to, to look at uh, is that you also want to make sure that you have some sort of social media presence 
before running a campaign. The reason we say this is because uh, when we're running a campaign, influencers are going to be creating content to drive traffic to your Instagram page or your TikTok page uh, and your website. And if you don't have engaging content there in those areas, then that traffic is not going to be as effective. Uh, you're not, they'll likely won't, fo <clears throat> won't follow you and, and so on. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so those are the things that um, you want to look for, making sure that uh, that influencers can reach the audience that you're looking for. And also um, that your company is set up for success uh, when it comes to, before you think about running that initial influencer campaign. Um, I, I, I wanted to walk uh, everyone through what it would look like to, to run your first influencer campaign. Uh, and so I have a few steps broken down into that. So uh, when, when, you, when you're thinking about running a campaign, you always want to start with uh, who is the customer you want to reach and then work backwards from there. Uh, for us, whenever we do this, we uh, on our platform, uh, we're, we're big into analytics and data. And so we're, we're collecting all sorts of different uh, data from our influencers about their audience and about uh, the influencers themselves. And so we'll look at uh, the age group, the gender, the location. Uh, we'll also, uh, we have influencer demographics that the influencers income, their marital status, uh, their employment status, uh, their language, and, and, a, and a bunch of other things that, uh, that we look at to, to make sure that we're, we're aligning uh, we can first reach the audience that, that we're looking for and that the influencers are uh, well aligned to, to reach that audience as well. Uh, the other thing is you want to make sure that you're very clear on what type of uh, results you're looking to, to get from your campaign. Uh, so there's a few different types of campaigns you can run. Um, awareness, of course, there's a lot of awareness campaigns, conversion campaigns, launch campaigns. These are the three most common uh, types of campaigns you want to run. The reason why uh, understanding this early on is, is important is because the messaging in each uh, for each influencer is going to be based off of this. Uh, for us, what we like to do is if we're introducing a new brand or a new product to the market, we always start with an awareness component and then lead it into a conversion, uh, com uh, a conversion component later on in the campaign. And so what we'll do is we'll have the influencers start by talking about the value proposition of a product, talking, introducing the brand and, um, and just kind of sharing and documenting their experience with the product. And then maybe a couple of weeks later, we'll have them go in and, uh, and, and create a, another piece of content. And now this time they're sharing a promo code, a URL driving traffic to uh, your, your, uh, a checkout page or your download page or, or your landing page for if it's a lead generation campaign or something like that. So um, those would be the a few things that uh, I would make sure of before you start your first campaign because uh, each of the messaging has to resonate and it has to be based off of what your end goal is. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is the content is what's going to make or break uh, this or it's going to have the biggest impact on the success of your campaign. And so uh, you wanna make sure uh, you have a, you, you understand the types of influencers you're working with and what type of content they're already creating. And uh, if the messaging that you're looking for is gonna be a natural fit for the type of content that are already sharing. Um, and so what, what, what I mean by that is for us, uh, in this case, like what you're seeing, this is a company we work with out of uh, Montreal. It's a company called Food Hero. And uh, for them, they're looking to engage uh, lifestyle. Like, this is a more, they're, they're looking to engage lifestyle influencers who are busy, who, uh, who uh, care about uh, saving or like care about climate change and want to, uh, and want to reduce uh, CO2 from the environment. So those are uh, a, a few of the traits or the demographics that uh, they, they were targeting. And so we went and reached out to influencers and we, we, uh, we found influencers who were creating lifestyle content um, and not, not that they were like uh, 
climate change experts or anything like that, but uh, it, it was a natural fit and the type of content they were looking for was a natural fit as well. And so um, th those are the few things to keep in mind. The biggest thing when it comes to content is you don't want to uh, be micromanaging these influencers. Uh, the reason for that is because they know how to engage their audience, right? And so you want to provide them guidance. For example, in this, for this campaign, we had a requirement, which is every photo needed to display the food hero uh, splash screen, the loading screen on their app. Uh, so that was a requirement. Uh, but outside of that, we, we left it up to them. And so for some influencers, they actually went to a grocery store and, and they, they created content there, which is what you see here. Others actually ordered the stuff and brought it home and, and created content at home. Whatever fit with their lifestyle and whatever uh, was a fit for their brand, you want to give them guidance, but you don't want to tell them exactly what to do. Uh, make it so it's like, these are our key value propositions that we want out of your campaign. Uh, this is what we want you to mention. Um, and, and this is the key thing that we want you to take a photo with. But outside of that, let them kind of decide what's going to be most engaging for their audience. The same is when it comes to posting, they understand what times they need to be posting uh, when it comes to like the time their audience is most engaged, the time their audience is online the most and, and things like that. And uh, you know, if you're running the campaign on your own, you won't have access to that data, but influencers have it in their profile. And so uh, those are the things that you could ask for. And um, you could, you, but by default, uh, what I would recommend is to trust the influencer and to, and to work with them to, to figure out uh, what, would, what, what they would recommend for your campaign and, and have it as a collaborative approach when you're running a, a campaign like this. We have a question, Umer. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so with respect um, to content, so I like how you've described how to make sure that the content that influencers are posting is aligning with the product. But even before then, um, Sandra's wondering, how do you handle influencers believing in the products they promote so they don't injure trust with their own audiences? And how does that match happen even before um, they get a contract? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, for us, we, we've implemented some things that we do to, uh, to, to ensure that it's, it's going to be a strong fit for the brand. And one of the things that we do is uh, we actually ask the influencers what would make them a fit for the campaign. And then we'll ask them a few other more demographic related questions to understand outside of just pure data, what uh, just having something uh, other than that to to understand more about the influencers. Uh, the other things that I would look at or that I would, I would explore is uh, actually looking at their profile to make sure that they're not promoting uh, like your, your competitors. For us under Embold, we have a service agreement that we use, uh, which, is, uh, which, may, or which outlines that they cannot be promoting a competitor 30 days before or 30 days after uh, the campaign. Uh, but uh, I think it's it's about finding those quality influencers, right? Because the quality influencers are going to care about and are going to pay a lot of attention to what type of uh, advertisers they're working with. And and uh, if you look at an influencer's profile, and all they're promoting are brands, and they're actually not really creating content, and that's probably not an ideal influencer uh, for you to work with. Whereas on the other hand. The, the more suitable approach is finding uh, engaging influencers who are already creating content who, who you think could be a fit for your brand and then engaging them for your campaign. That would be the approach I would take. Uh, and then of course you can have them, um, you, you can have them share uh, like why you, why they think they would be a fit for your campaign uh, and have them sign service agreements that they're not going to promote competitors for. We have our standard is 30 days before or 30 days after, but uh, we do have an option to extend it for the year. And, uh, and but like even if you're working with influencers directly, those are some of the things that I would look at as well. Wonderful, thank you. Awesome, yeah, no worries. Uh, sorry, I lost my cursor. Okay, there you are. Okay. Um, some of the other things to uh, to look at when uh, your campaign is live is uh, to make sure you're monitoring the success of your campaign. 
making sure that influencers have met all the requirements. So they've shared all of your links, they've tagged the right account. Uh, and then once a the campaign is live, you can also start to see which campaigns are engaging or which pieces of content are engaging the most, which influencers are outperforming others, uh, things like that. So those are uh, the things that you wanna look out for as well. Um, this is again, some of the challenges when it comes to working with influencers is that there's a lot of moving parts. And so uh, on, on an average campaign for us, we're working with like eight to 10, sometimes 12 influencers for a campaign. And uh, so as you can imagine, there's, uh, you know, making sure that everyone has the right tags, the right hashtags, uh, the captions are correct, everything like that. Uh, those are the things that you want to make sure uh, you're assigning, you're taking time out for and, and uh, making sure that um, that it's all aligned on that side as well. Um, there's a few things that we would recommend looking out for when you're running your first campaign. Uh, the first is making sure that the influencers have an authentic audience. Um, if as you get deeper into uh, influencer marketing and the influencer world, what you'll start to realize is that it's really easy to become a fake influencer. And this is a problem that we're, we're trying to solve and we are working on, on solving uh, because right now it's very easy for anyone to log in and buy 10,000 followers, right? But that doesn't, uh, that's not gonna drive any value to advertisers. And so a lot of clients uh, that will work with or that, that are hesitant to run an influencer campaign, it's likely because they either know of someone or they themselves have run a campaign in the past where they saw little to no results. And this is usually because of a low quality influencer that they work with. Uh, so for, for, for us at Embold, we've implemented a few things. Uh, we've implemented what we refer to as like a bot detection tool. Uh, essentially it monitors the influencer's audience growth and engagement growth over time um, because we have enough uh, data from Facebook and Instagram to know what an organic account should be growing at. And when we see sudden drops or spikes in engagement or a predictable pattern, uh, those are signs of either someone buying followers, uh, someone's followers that were bought and then kind of dropped off because that's, that's what happens when you buy followers. Sometimes they just like kind of disappear because Facebook will find them and delete them. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, is some people use like a bot and what, what they will do is they will mass follow, mass unfollow people. And again, that's a sign of an inauthentic audience. And so uh, for us, that's, uh, those are some of the things that, that we would look for. Uh, that, that's what we've implemented for the bot detection tool. Another thing that we look at is where the audience is relative to where the influencer is located. Um, and so uh, when you're working with an influencer and let's just say you're working with an influencer directly, I would highly recommend asking them to send you a screenshot of their audience analytics and understanding where that audience is located. If for example, um, your influencer is based in Ontario and all of their content is about their lifestyle, uh, whether it be like outdoors content um, about their job, about their family and everything like that. Uh, but their audience is somewhere halfway across the world. That's usually going to be a sign that those followers are bought as well. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a sign that I like that. Uh, it's not really a, a, a real influencer or, or someone that you want to be working with because those followers have been purchased. So those are, th that's the easiest way. Uh, if influencers are, are hesitating in providing you those analytics, then that would also be a red flag. For us, it's a requirement for influencers to link their, uh, they actually have to link several things. They have to link their phone number, their bank account, as well as their social media accounts to the platform. Um, and we use the social media accounts to uh, verify that the audience is authentic and it is actually uh, they are actually a quality influencer on the platform. Uh, so those are the few things that we look for. And then the, uh, the last thing to look out for when you're working with influencer is when it comes to the compensation. When I started the business, one of the things I started to see is that uh, every influencer I would talk to had their own way of assigning compensation. I would talk to one influencer who'd have 10,000 followers and would be charging me $100 per post. 
and I would talk to another influencer with 10,000 followers and very similar engagement who charged me like 500 or $600 per post. And what that made me realize is that there's no way we could, uh, we could grow this business because we couldn't predict what the cost was going to be. And so uh, what, what we started to do is we started to interview hundreds of different influencers. We took all that data and then we took data from uh, the Facebook and ad platform and kind of combined it and built our own uh, pricing algorithm that's aligned, that's aligned with what an advertiser would already be paying an influencer on uh, the Facebook ad platform. But when you're working with influencers directly, uh, that's one of the things I would be really cautious of and make sure that you're talking to multiple influencers um, in, in that area and, and getting prices from them, just so you can get a quick idea of what that market is. Um, and so, so those are the few things that I would recommend. The other thing that, uh, the, and then the other rule as a startup, we're, we're still in our early days where we're at about like 11 employees now, but, um, we don't have a lot of rules, but one of the rules that, that we have is we don't work with agents or anyone who represents influencers, uh, because what we found is that, uh, agents always overprice their influencers. Uh, as opposed to independently, like as as opposed to like independently run accounts, uh, because when these influencers are working, uh, like we'll, we'll work with them and we'll have, uh, you know, we'll pay them a hundred, two hundred dollars per post, whereas an agent will be requiring like six to eight hundred dollars per post, and you know, for 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 us, there's no way we can justify working uh, with an influencer like that because. You know, they're they're not uh, our clients are not going to get the same amount of reach or engagement uh, for them to justify that investment, and so that would be something else that we would be cautious of. Uh, agencies are different. There are agencies that are very transparent about how they go about compensating their influencers, but there's agents who are like individuals. It's not really a company; it's just a single person, and they're managing like ten or fifteen influencers. Uh, be something that I would I would look out for and. Uh, just shop around a little bit more before you before you jump into that campaign. Um, when it comes to running a campaign, we, we have a pretty standard process that we follow. Uh, and this is a process that you could explore uh, for yourself when, when you're looking at a campaign. But uh, what we start with is by building out a, a client brief that outlines what your requirement requirements are who is the target audience, what the content needs to look like, what the timeline is, and who the ideal influencers are. Uh, we take all of this, we build out a brief, uh, we create the campaign on the platform, uh, but for yourself, it's really important to uh, gather all this information for yourself as well, just so you know what the campaign expectations are, and you have a document that you can share with influencers. Uh, then the next thing, is going to be when it comes to uh, finding influencers. Uh, that's kind of like the next step. Once you have all the information, you can start reaching out to influencers and uh, and start inviting them to your campaign and, and kind of seeing who's interested in exploring that campaign uh, with you. Uh, for us, we have our own roster of influencers. Um, we, we have a roster of over 4,000 micro influencers across Canada. And so for us, we always reach out to that roster first, but uh, if you're running this campaign independently, you would just start messaging influencers on Instagram or uh, emailing them if they have their email online and uh, just seeing who would be the most ideal influencer uh, for that campaign. Uh, from there, uh, once you find those influencers and they've shown an interest to work with you, you want to you wanna figure out who's going to be, uh, which influencers are going to be the most aligned when it comes to your compensation, your budget, uh, and also can meet the requirements that you're looking for. Uh, from there, once you've once you've kind of aligned all of those and you've narrowed down the best influencers you want to work with, uh, then it's time to move on to content creation. Uh, once you've selected the influencers, you want to share the campaign brief with them, let them know what the co content requirements are and what the timeline is, so then they can start to create content and and start. Uh, uh, start to create content and, and submit it to you for approval. If you want a very simple way of, of setting up your content submission portal, uh, you know, when we started the business, we used something very simple. We just used Google Drive. 
and uh, we created folders there and we shared the folders with each influencers and uh, then influencers would just submit content to us for approval there and we would just monitor it and, and review it and leave feedback. Uh, so that would be kind of like a very like a very inexpensive way for you to implement an influencer strategy is message influencers directly, create like a Google Drive, which is kind of like your go-to uh, content portal. And then from there, uh, once they submit content to you for approval, uh, that you want to make sure you carefully review all of the content, all of the messaging. Um, again, you did provide them some like uh, like some freedom when it comes to creating content, but uh, you want to make sure um, all the messaging is on brand. Uh, they're, they've mentioned everything they were supposed to mention. Uh, they've covered, they've highlighted all the key components, everything like that. And now they're ready to, to go out and, and, and uh, start posting. Uh, once they've done that, they can, uh, now you're onto the delivery portion where the influencers will start posting the content that was approved and start sharing it with their audience. Uh, and once they share it, uh, you want to uh, compile all the analytics and the performance of the campaign. Uh, there's a few different ways you can do that. Uh, for, for us, of course, it's done through the platform, but uh, if you were doing this campaign on your own, uh, I would personally recommend having influencers submit a screenshot of their analytics so you can see the reach, the engagement, and the overall performance of that campaign. Uh, of course, if you, have, uh, if you have links that you were sharing, uh, that's another way. Sorry, I'm not sure why I keep getting notifications, but... Um, uh, if you're, uh, if you, you can also have them just share uh, like a screenshot of their analytics, and I will just show you that. Uh, if you if they were sharing links, you could uh, you would just monitor those links. If you use Bitly, Bitly is really good and it can easily show you the performance of that campaign, and uh, and walk you through that as well. Um, then to move on to the next thing, when it comes to measuring the ROI of a campaign. This is really important because uh, when it comes to marketing, um, you know, for a lot of advertisers, they're really hesitant on, on jumping into new things when it comes to marketing because, uh, you know, they're uh, like, sometimes their experiences haven't been great. And, you know, they've run these very abstract campaigns that didn't really drive any real tangible results. And so uh, you wanna make sure that you're, you're setting yourself up for success uh, when it comes to this as well, there's a few things that we do. The first is we have a trackable link for every campaign uh, that that we run, so we can we can drive traffic to either a download page, a purchase page, or wherever else to make sure that uh, that that uh, we can actually drive either downloads, purchases, uh, or other results, and we track this as well. Um, one of the things about trackable links, if you were running uh, like a conversion focused campaign, uh, we would like we only work with influencers that have at least 10,000 followers on Instagram. The reason for that is because Instagram has this requirement that if someone has 10,000 followers, they're able to do uh, something called a swipe up link on their stories, where it takes someone directly from their stories right to your landing page. And so because of that, we have this, like we have this requirement that like, if we're running a conversion focused campaign, uh, we will, we only work with influencers that have at least 10,000 followers. Uh, from there, uh, in addition to the, the trackable links, <clears throat> we also have promo codes and coupons that we use. Uh, we'll create unique promo codes or sometimes our clients will create unique promo codes uh, for each of the influencers. So we can see the performance of each influencer and which influencers promoted the, uh, or performed the best, um, because then you can re like work with some influencers again in the future. Then the last thing, um, again, this is just so you can track the performance of your campaign against some of the other campaigns, uh, because ultimately likes or comments are not going to make a tangible difference on your business, right? So. What you're really, really focused on is the first two, which is the trackable links and the promo codes. But the marketing KPIs we look for are things like impressions, reach, engagement, which is like likes and comments uh, and clicks and a few other things. Uh, but again, this is gonna be uh, the, the least tangible, right? Because 
this is just going to help you understand the performance of that campaign. Um, and especially if, if this was like an awareness campaign, but the first two are the most important if you're running a conversion focused campaign. Uh, for us, I'll, just to tell you a little bit about our platform, um, uh, we, we started building this platform in 2019. And so in 2019, we built our influencer portal, which allowed us to automate how we recruit influencers. Uh, from there, we built our campaign management portal to automate our own agency. Uh, and then now we're building our self-serve software as a, like the software as a service. It's like a subscription platform. And, uh, and that's, that's we're, we're currently in our, our beta stages where we have clients using it, giving us feedback and, uh, and our beta stage is just finishing up. So, and then now it'll be, it will be uh, in, in full production mode pretty soon. So uh, that's just some background into the platform, but there's three main components of the platform. There is the influencer discovery, uh, which helps you run searches. So you can go and find the influencers who are most aligned with your brand. So this is the type of search result you'll get. Uh, you'll see the influencers following their engagement. You'll see where they're located, uh, as well as what, this is the embold suggested price per post. Um, and so the reason we've done that is so you know what uh, roughly what that influencer uh, influencer is worth and, uh, or sorry, their posts, what their posts are worth. And uh, from there, you can start to uh, engage them further. Uh, once you do that, you can, uh, you can get into the campaign management side, uh, which is uh, we have a campaign management portal where you can create your campaign, invite influencers, uh, manage your content. Um, also, we have like an inbox, of course, where you can talk to the influencers. You can view all of their analytics everything like that. Uh, and then the last part of the platform is the reporting and payouts. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the influencers link their bank accounts when they sign up. The reason for that is so you can pay them right away and very easily on the platform. Uh, so when they, when they go through their, uh, the, you, you'll jump on, you can invite them to your campaign. Once you work with them and it's time to pay them, you can pay them with a few clicks as well. Um, and how that, how that, how that will flow is that uh, you'll initiate the payment and we'll complete the payment on your behalf just to make sure everything is aligned uh, and the influencers have met the requirements. At the end of every campaign, you'll also see, uh, you will also see the performance of that campaign. So you can see the likes, the comments, the impressions. For us, because we're tied in from the back end through the Facebook API, we collect the analytics for you um, right away. And so are, if you're posting, if you were running a post campaign, like a, if the influencers are sharing a post, uh, those, that performance will be updated every hour. And if they were sharing a story that is updated every 30 minutes. And so those uh, reports are updated for you and are regularly updated. So you can see which influencers are performing the best uh, and, and how your campaign is going as well. Uh, we also offer fully managed campaigns. Uh, this has been the side of our business that's been live since day one. Uh, this is for teams that want to run a campaign but don't have the resources or the, or the time to run the campaign themselves. And so for something like this, uh, our team will come in and uh, create a campaign brief for you. As I mentioned, we'll find the influencers, manage the content to make sure everything is aligned and, and uh, is, on, uh, is according to what we what we wanted to do. And then from there, we'll go out and make sure the, uh, the campaign is delivered and we'll send you a report on the campaign uh, as well. So you can monitor the performance of that campaign. So that's how uh, our, our campaigns are set up. Um, we, like these are the two main sides of our business. Um, when it, and then also that, that brings us to, to this presentation. So uh, we recently partnered with uh, Innovation Guelph and uh, we're offering all of, all uh, Innovation Guelph clients 50% off the platform for 12 months. Um, and so to, to take advantage of, of this offer, uh, you can actually just contact <clears throat> the Innovation Guelph team and, and they'll connect you with a member of my team and we can go from there. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. That's pretty much all that I wanted to go over. If you have any more questions regarding anything that we've discussed, <clears throat> this is my email address. Uh, just feel free to, to contact me and I'll get back to you 
uh, and I'm more than happy to, to connect further and answer any other questions that you have. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so we do have a couple of questions and a couple of topics that I'd like to circle back to. Um, we have one clarification question first and then we'll go back to the other ones that we held until the end, okay? So our first question, um, going back to the influencer discovery page, which was slide 14, um, Allison's wondering, just to confirm that screen is not is, is just showed for clients. So if we registered with Embold and not for general public consumption use, so they not the general public can't see um, worth like per post. Right? Yeah, they, they can't see that, no. It's only for uh, advertisers who have paid and are on the platform and are using it. Uh, then they can see uh, the analytics. So they'll see what, uh, what the audience is that the influencer has reached to, as well as their compensation and everything like that. Awesome, thank you. Um, you mentioned Bitly. Can you talk more about Bitly um, in terms of the role of using it uh, rather than a direct link to a website, for example? So that was slide 11. Yeah, totally. So for, for a lot of our clients, they'll use uh, like a, like a, a short trackable link uh, and they'll create unique links for several people in their, uh, in their campaign. So they'll create like a unique link for each influencer in their campaign. Uh, Bitly, the reason we use Bitly and a lot of other clients use Bitly is because it's very easy to track and they don't have to go through like their like tech person on their, on their, uh, in their company or, or something like that. They can just create an account. They know, um, and how Bitly works is essentially you take uh, the end, like the end URL, like where you want to drive the traffic to, and uh, you can create multiple links for that one URL. So uh, if you wanted to, for example, drive traffic to your product page, uh, you can, and then instead of having your like technical person on your team creating 10 different links for you, you can just log into Bitly and create a unique link for every influencer. Uh, and it's very easy to see the performance of, of that campaign and, and how many people click on it, where they were from, um, if they were on mobile or desktop. Um, it's just the reason we use Bitly is because it's very easy for us to get, get a campaign live. <clears throat> awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so you provided a very um, detailed picture of um, your platform and, and why somebody might choose to go the influencer marketing route, but I'm wondering if we can just take a step back for um, some people that need some definitions for some. Well, I think you put yourself on mute there while you were talking, sorry. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> no um, so yeah, just taking a step back. Um, so is the purpose of a campaign so that the influencer shares your product multiple times as opposed to paying them a one-time fee to post once. So can you explain to us like what is a campaign and wh why would we choose that over something else? Yeah, so we just like to like refer to a, a campaign as like multiple influencers posting multiple times. We run one-off like promotions where an influencer is just promoting, promoting a product once. But we found those campaigns are not very effective, uh, especially because, uh, you know, like there's so much content on Instagram. Like uh, if, if you go on Instagram, every time you load, there's like more pieces of content being shared. There's so many people posting content online. And so it's really hard to stand out. Uh, plus, uh, you know, just uh, as, a, as a marketing rule of thumb, like you want your clients to see your product multiple times and it increases the, the chances of them engaging with you over time as well. And so uh, that's the reason why for us, our most standard campaign that we run will be influencers posting two posts and two stories over a two week period. And so that's our like go-to, if our client is really not sure and uh, they wanna get a campaign live right away, that's the, the format that we go with. Um, and, and, the, and I guess the objective of a campaign will be uh, it's it's what you're it's based on your business needs, right? Like if, for example, uh, your business uh, you want to promote a specific product or service, uh, how a campaign could work for you is you come in and start with more of an awareness component, talk, having influencers talk more about um, about that product or service, and then going into more of a conversion. So 
having dri driving traffic to either a landing page or a download page or, uh, or uh, like a uh, like yeah, like a landing page, purchase page, or a download page. Like that's what a, a typical campaign would look like. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so we have another question from um, Sonal. Do you work with specific industries and or businesses? For example, their business is an art and color energy healing business. So that would be kind of more niche. So um, do, you, do you see a fit for something like that? Yeah, for us, we work with uh, advertisers across multiple industries where we've gotten the most traction is um, in, in the food and beverage space, in the, in the finance space. Uh, and then more recently, we're growing into e-commerce, but uh, we've worked with clients outside of that. Like, uh, like actually over the weekend, we signed a client, it's an RV company in Alberta. So we're promoting uh, their showrooms across Alberta. So it's not, not really a market that that we expected we would be in, but um, it's again, uh, I think it just starts with like, if we can confidently, if we can confidently say that we can reach the customer, then we can justify a campaign. We've turned campaigns down before, if we felt like it wasn't aligned with um, with the influencers, like we were running, like, um, like if, for example, like if, if you're, um, in, like you're selling like an investing product or something, or like a uh, like a B two B product, especially it's not a not going to be a fit for um, the types of client that you can reach on Instagram. But when it comes to this specific example, it's like uh, there's a good chance that we can find the right influencers. It just depends on uh, like we would just need to know more about the product and the, and the service to know if if the client yeah if we could reach enough of your end users to justify that campaign for you. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, we received a follow-up question from Eric. Eric um, has a very specific niche market for disc golf. So he was also wondering how do you tailor influencer selection? So kind of in line with what you were saying, as, um, if we can provide you a, um, as much information as possible about our product and what we're looking for, then it kind of sets you, um, you guys up um, for success in finding those influencers, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I think when it comes to uh, very niche products, um, if we can find influencers in those markets that are already talking about that, and this is a natural extension of what they're talking about, then it can work. But if it's like, for example, if we have lifestyle influencers or travel influencers promoting a product like that, uh, like we know it won't work, right? Like maybe maybe one percent or a small fraction of their audience will be uh will be that customer but more likely not so for for a campaign like that we would just do some more research to see if we can find some influencers that would be uh influencers in that market or confidently speak about that and that will help us better like assess that campaign excellent thank you yeah our next question is from agnes um, and I'm sure your answer kind of will vary based on the actual need of the client, but could you give us a ballpark? What is the cost of a fully managed campaign? So maximum. Yeah. Um, so there's three main components that go into running a fully managed. There's the number of influencers. Uh, the second is going to be uh, the total pieces of content. Uh, and the third is going to be the total reach. And so we can combine all, we can play around with all three of those to get to uh, the campaign budget that we need to, right? So for us, when we work with a fully managed client, we always start with one campaign. Uh, it's kind of like a test or a pilot campaign for them because although we can provide clients with case studies and previous campaigns and results, um, nothing is gonna be as valuable as their own campaign results, right? So we always run that one campaign for them first once they can see that result, then we work with them on a long-term basis. But for that initial campaign, our, our campaigns would be anywhere between like uh, like five to like twelve thousand uh, dollars. That's usually where our campaigns will start. Uh, but you know, for for a starter campaign, it's usually going to be around there. So, um, uh, for example, like a five thousand dollar campaign would likely get you uh, six to ten different influencers. Um, on average with like 10 to 30,000 followers. Again, these are like large, large ranges, but 
we would just like dig deeper into it once we run that campaign. And for a campaign like that, would likely be four pieces of content. Like I said earlier, it's like two posts and two stories. That would be a standard campaign that we would run. Awesome, thanks. Okay, another question. Um, if I find an influencer, how should I reach out to them? Would Embold be the middleman so that we don't directly reach out and create a contract? And how does Embold kind of work uh, around there a little bit more? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, if you were just running a campaign by yourself, uh, the best way to do that would be uh, initially just like build out a list of influencers you want to work with, get their emails. It's pretty easy to get their emails. Most of them will actually list their emails on their profiles because they want to work with advertisers. And so they're providing you uh, their consent to reach out to them. They'll, a lot of them will actually say DM me for collaborations or email me for collaborations. And so um, <clears throat> that would be uh, the best way if you were to run a campaign yourself. Um, whereas on the platform, how we do it is we're, uh, we're, they link their phone number and their email account. So when you invite them to a campaign, uh, they get a text and an email notification right away. And you know, if, if you know any influencers, you know that they're always on their phone. So they'll get back to you pretty fast. And uh, once once they do, uh, you'll, uh, you know, they, you can start chatting with them to understand share uh, so they can like share uh, their perspectives on the campaign you can share your needs and then uh, see which influencers are going to be a fit but you can do it either way like you can message influencers directly and for us like um, how we've done it is we, we've tried to build a platform that just caters to everything from start to finish uh, and so that way it's like everything from like finding the influencers to contracting to managing content reporting paying them out all of these things I've done manually when I started the business. I was e-transferring influencers and reviewing screenshots and all that kind of stuff. But now we've, we've automated all of that. And so uh, although you can do it manually, um, I think like it's going to be worth your investment to just pay like a small fraction of, and you know, you're going to save hours uh, just through the platform by just going in and, and doing it there. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I haven't had any more questions come in. I do have some myself. So while I go through those with Umair, please feel free to keep sending your questions in the chat box. We have lots of time left. Um, no question is too specific. There are no dumb questions, as we always say. So um, put them in there and I'll make sure we get to them. Um, so slide number seven. Okay, so your clear outcomes slide. You talked about um, awareness campaigns, conversion campaigns, and launch campaigns. Wondering if you can provide some more definitions around each of those three campaigns, and then possibly an example um, or a, a general example about what the difference is and why um, a specific business might choose one of the campaigns over another. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think when it comes to defining a campaign, like uh, those are just very broad, like industry terms. And that's why I've used them like an awareness campaign would be uh, a campaign where influencers are just talking about a brand. Um, you know, when we, when we run an awareness campaign, we're, we're either just introducing uh, like a service or a product, their value proposition. It's just focused on just talking about the product. Uh, whereas a conversion campaign would be a more well-known product, something that's already been in the market for a little bit. And for those products, it would be more uh, driving traffic to a conversion point, like um, where it's like download the app um, purchase, that you can purchase this product here and so on. And so, uh, and then the launch campaign will be a hybrid between, between the two. So uh, we just we just launched a campaign for this uh, uh, this cosmetics brand, um, and uh, for them, their their product is sold at Sephora, and so for them, we had influencers uh, go in and the first post was more of, a, a more of an awareness post where influencers were just talking about um, about the product, the value proposition, and so on. We're just kind of introducing this new product that this company has released, and then the later post was here. Uh, swipe up to go to the Sephora link and and purchase a product for yourself or, uh, and then also like you can share promo codes at times and, and things like that but I think uh, like the terms 
aren't as important as what your business needs are. So I would just kind of base it off of what your specific business needs are and, and go based off of that. So um, if, for example, you, you're just introducing your product to a new market, I would, instead of just running a campaign talking about uh, telling people to purchase or download or anything like that, um, you want to start at the top of the marketing funnel, which is like introduce your product, introduce your value proposition, uh, just like you would with any other campaign. Like that would be a good place to start. That's not to say that you can't include a link. Um, for us, we have links in all the pages. It's just driving traffic to a different uh, to a different link. Um, I think I think that's the way to look at. It. Awesome. Um, my other question was, you talked about getting the um, analytics from your influencers' um, Instagrams and reviewing those yourself to make sure um, you align um, with their audience. I I think. Um, so what exactly, when I'm asking for those analytics, what exactly am I looking for and where can I find it um, when I receive that from them? Um, just I'm thinking some people might not be familiar with what that looks like. Yeah, that's a really good question. So for, for some of that, uh, on Instagram, analytics are very straightforward. Uh, there's three things that you're looking for. Um, the, and you'll, you'll usually get a screenshot with all three of them. The first is uh, the audience location. And there's two ways they can break it down. They can do it by city or by country. Uh, of course, by city is gonna be more important. So I would ask for that. Uh, I would also make sure that they're showing you the percentages of the audience uh, because on Instagram, and honestly, I'm not sure why they do this, but uh, you can tap it once and it will hide the percentages and tap it again and it will show the percentage so like how much of the audience is in Ontario or Toronto, for example, and how much of it is in, in other cities. And so I think that percentage of their following uh, in, in each market is very important. And so make sure you can see that. So making sure your audience, the audience that you're looking to reach is also the audience that they can reach. So I think that's the first thing. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, age demographics, it will give you data on that as well. Uh, so, uh, for the most part, uh, I think the, the largest demographic on Instagram is going to be anywhere between 18 to 35, up to like 45, uh, and then you'll see it start to drop off right away. Uh, and so, but each influencer is a little bit different. And so those, that's the other thing that uh, you're, you're looking for. And the last is Instagram also gives you the gender breakdown. Uh, and so that's the other thing to look for, right? So uh, I think all of all three of those things combined will give you a really good idea of, of what that campaign is or like what who that influencer is and uh, how they align with the audience you want to reach. Thanks. Um, okay, so a couple more questions in the chat box. Thank you, everyone. Um, Brad is wondering, on average, how much time should I be prepared to commit um, to each of your programs. So um, how much time does it take on our end to set these up and manage them based on uh, what our business needs are? Yeah, um, when it comes to running a campaign, uh, if, if you're doing it yourself, I would will, I will take anywhere between seven, seven to 10 days to actually find influencers at least. So up to two weeks, I would say, um, to finding influencers. So this is like, inviting them to your campaign and then uh, having them apply and provide you all the information like their analytics and stuff like that. So that way you can you can understand who the influencers are. So about, about two weeks to coordinate with the influencers. Um, and then about another week to two weeks, depending on uh, your product and your business on, uh, to, for the influencers to create content. So for example, if they're promoting an app and they can do it from home, uh, I, we would normally give them about a week to create content. If it's a product that needs to be shipped out, then you have to take that time into account. If it's a, a physical location that you want the influencers to go to, then again, you want to account for that. So uh, it will be another week or two, depending on what your business is or what your product is. That's how I would uh, I would feel about it. Uh, and the last thing would be uh, once a campaign is live, every campaign will be a little bit different, but uh, once once you're, you found the influencers, they've, they've uh, created the content, uh, then it just depends on how often they're posting or how much content they're posting. Uh, for our campaigns, our, our center campaign is two posts and two stories. 
Uh, for that, we like to split content up a week apart. So we'll post uh, one post and one story in week one and another post and another story in week two. And that's how we like to split it up. Uh, that would be like our, our usual go-to uh, campaign. Uh, so again, then that will take you another week or two. And then another week is to gather all the analytics, all the reporting at the end. Uh, so it could be a long campaign. You know, it could take you up to like five to seven weeks to run a campaign. Um, for, for a fully managed with Envolve, it takes us about three weeks to get a campaign live. Week one is for influencers. Week two, it's for, well, two to three is going to be for content. Again, depending on if we're shipping out um, product, if we're traveling and stuff like that. Uh, and then the last week is just left to, uh, as like a buffer zone, to make edits, to make changes to content, to do content, stuff like that before it goes live. Um, but that's that's like the timeline that you're usually looking at. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next question is from George, which is a great question. Um, so we've talked mostly about B2C um, influencer marketing. Is there anything that exists for B2B? Yeah, B2B influencer marketing is something that I've started to come across a little bit more of, uh, but it's still happening on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure what type of, uh, like how successful those campaigns are, just given what the average demographics are on Instagram. For us, our team is exploring like a LinkedIn uh, integration where we want to sign up people on LinkedIn as influencers and have them promote that for more B2B content. But for us, we're like we're so early on in that, that uh, like we don't even have a timeline for that just yet. So um, we, you know, it might be something that we can release this year, but uh, we don't know yet. And uh, honestly, I'm not sure if, uh, if there is a platform for LinkedIn uh, influencers. Uh, no, it's not, not something that I've come across. I know I've come across a lot of like TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, that's usually the most popular, but I haven't come across anything for LinkedIn. Great, thank you. Okay, next question from Robin. For a startup with a growing but still small Instagram following, what is the minimum number of followers an influencer should have for us to work with them? We are just shifting into our first influencer campaigns as we launch next month. And then my follow-up question to that is, can you explain a little bit more about the term micro-influencing as opposed to other forms of influencing? Yeah, uh, and I was actually just thinking about that. I was like, I'm pretty sure I was supposed to have a slide in there that said what micro influencers are, and I totally missed it. So, uh, micro influencers are everyone will have a little bit of a different way of defining it, but for how we define it, it's uh, an influencer with anywhere between 3,000 to like up to like 30, 40, 50,000 followers. Uh, we do have influencers that are a little bit bigger than that, but um, you know. Uh, once they get past that 100,000 mark, then they would be considered like a macro influencer. Um, this is the point where you'll start to see a lot of influencers get agents and get uh, someone to represent them. Uh, it also slows your campaign down because now you're talking to someone else to run your campaign. Uh, it also gets significantly more expensive. Um, and then uh, beyond that is what we would define, like once they get into the million, two million, and we would just define them as like a celebrity influencer. Uh, and, now, uh, and so those would be the three main. And then anything below 3,000, we would define them as like a nano influencer. Um, nano influencers are really great. They're really inexpensive to work with, uh, but they do have a limited reach. And to scale up that campaign, you have to work with so many influencers uh, that for us, we've like, we do work with them from time to time, but for the most part, we usually don't. We usually just work with influencers um, for the most part with at least like 10,000 followers, I would say. But um, as they get smaller, like it is a more concentrated uh, audience, which is really good. It is going to be uh, uh, like more affordable to work with. And so that's, of course, good for, for startups, but it's also tougher to manage because now uh, this now you're getting into the territory where these influencers might not have worked with an advertiser before. And so they don't know what the influencer world is like. And so uh, like getting content on time and, and things like that could also be an issue. And so those would be the four main criterias for 
uh, the types of influencers. When it comes to startups, uh, our, my personal route would be to work with influencers. Uh, it depends on who the audience is, but if you're looking to go by like geographic markets, I would go for influencers between 10 and 30,000 followers. Uh, and that would be the route that I would go. It's just like, so even for like larger advertisers that we work with, we work with like some national brands and even for their campaign, even though we're running, running like a Canada wide campaign, we'll break that down into like key markets, like key cities that we want to uh, reach out to and key cities that we want to reach. And, and then we also break that apart by like, for example, if 40% of your market is in Ontario, make sure 40%, roughly 40% of your influencers are in Ontario and, and so on. And so uh, I would say if, if you're starting out and your budget is limited, uh, I would try to work with at least influencers that have 10,000 followers so they can give you that swipe up link capability. Um, and then from there, um, just see who, who can reach your audience. I think as you get those analytics, it would be more helpful and it gets a little bit easier, but uh, that's, that's how I would go about it. Great, that's a good guideline, thank you. Um, so, um, Mickey and I know the answer to this, but can you re-clarify for us? Do you work with US influencers? Uh, we don't, we have, like we do have some influencers that have signed up from the US because of course we plan on expanding to the American market, but we're not actively reaching out to influencers. So um, we, uh, right now we're only focused on the Canadian market. Um, when it comes to the American market, there's a lot of influencer platforms that you can explore. Uh, and, you know, some of them are going to be affordable as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's different levels of it, but there's like some enterprise focus, like enterprise level software uh, solutions. Those are probably not the route that you want to go, of course, uh, because they're going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, those subscriptions are anywhere between ten to $40,000 a year. So they're quite expensive, but then there's a lot more affordable ones as well. It will be at maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars a month. So uh, there, there are those routes that you can take as well. Great, thank you. Um, we talked about this one a little earlier in the presentation, but could you reiterate for us a good starter pay for an influencer within those follower ranges that you explained for a campaign? Yeah. Um, so the way I, the way I'll answer that is like if it depends on what they're posting. So if they're posting a post, it will be anywhere between like $80 all the way up to maybe like $250. It just depends on their engagement, their reach and their audience. Uh, that would be like a good range. Uh, and then if they're posting a story, it would be, our rule of thumb is we always go usually a third or a fourth of what we'll pay for a story is what we'll pay for, a, sorry, what we'll pay for a post, we'll pay a third or a fourth for a story. So like if we're paying someone $100 for a post, we'll pay them like 30, to forty dollars for a story, like that's that's usually how we go about uh, compensating influencer because stories are temporary; they're only up for twenty four hours, and uh, and but we we like to leverage both. Uh, we don't really run like story only campaigns or post only campaigns. We like to mix it up a little bit, uh, and and that's how we go. Great, thanks. Um, another question from Robin. Do you have any advice for seeding for content by giving examples? So I know you explained we don't want to micromanage our uh, micro influencers and in the content they post, um, but is is there any guidelines around providing them samples about what we kind of like to see? Yeah, for sure. So uh, it's always great, if, especially if they're promoting a product that they can actually get your hands, uh, their hands on, on your product. Uh, we've worked with clients that have more expensive, like their average value would be a few hundred to sometimes maybe a thousand dollars or more. For those types of campaigns, we will actually ask the influencer, like we'll ship the product out to the influencer and ask them to ship it back at the end of the campaign. Uh, because just like, does it make sense for the client to give client, like give advertisers or give influencers a thousand, two thousand dollars per of product? Um, but for smaller, like where your cost per sample is lower, we highly recommend you give influencers something because then they can actually have it in hand, they can actually be using it and then, and then share it with your audience, right? 
Uh, it also helps them like create content that way. Um, I don't think we've ever run a campaign where it was a product campaign and we didn't have a product. I'm trying to think of it, but I don't think we have. Um, and we've run, of course, like if we're promoting an app, we can't physically uh, promote that. Like we, we can't have something physical, but we'll just show their phone or their laptop open with that on. But um, we, yeah, we don't run product campaigns without product. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, I got a question from Dennis. Um, so we know that if um, influencers are registered with Involved, then they're obviously interested in um, influencing and promoting a product. But in terms of outside Involved, how do you propose to somebody with a lot of followers to become an influencer for a marketing campaign? Uh, Dennis is wondering specifically about B2B, but how do you make that um, pitch and who do you go through and how do you make that initial ask for somebody with a lot of followers that you're not sure if they're registered through a platform like Unbold? Yeah, so um, if you were just running a campaign outside of the, any, any platform and you're just running it independently, uh, the best way is to just reach out to them directly. Uh, of course, as the influencers get larger, there's some influencers who will do this full time as their career. And so then they have someone monitoring it where they're actively monitoring their campaign uh, or their inbox or their DMs. And so uh, reaching out to them directly is important. Uh, keep in mind, like, um, like we've seen that when our clients reach out to influencers directly, influencers will usually ask for a bit more compensation than when we reach out to them. Because when they're signing up for a platform, they're pricing themselves in, uh, in a, on a marketplace, right? Uh, whereas when you're reaching out to influencers directly, uh, they know that you already want to work with them. And so for them, um, sometimes they'll charge you a little bit higher than normal. So um, the way to reach out to them would be just to kind of create a very simple pitch outlining what your objectives are, what type of influencers you're looking for, um, and to ask them to give you some sort of a bid of what they would be looking for, uh, for compensation like this. And at the bottom, uh, I would always highlight that, uh, that you're gonna be selecting, like it's a competitive process. You're gonna be selecting influencers who provide the best value to your brand. Um, and so just to reinforce that to, to the influencers as well. Uh, but that's, that's how I would go about messaging uh, to the influencers. Great, thank you. Um, okay, another question from Agnes. Once we start with an influencer, um, what does the process look like to cancel a contract? And what is the commitment after you've signed on? Do, is there a multi-contract commitment or what does that look like within Bold? So for, for us, uh, our plan is an annual plan, but it, uh, the reason we've done it this way is because we had some clients that started with us, ran a campaign and then uh, they like stopped the platform, or, like they canceled their subscription, but then when they, and a few months later they came back and, and wanted to re-access some of their previous campaigns. And so for us, we actually reduced our plan pricing. Um, initially our plans were starting at $1.99 and now we, we cut them in half and we started, we now they're starting at $9.99, or sorry, $99. And uh, the reason we've done it this way is because we wanna make it a more affordable solution and a tool that you can just have on hand uh, whenever you need a campaign. Uh, whenever you just want to run a, run a quick search, do some research to see if there is a fit. But more importantly, to have access to your previous content analytics and influencers that you've worked with. Um, when it comes to like once you once you've engaged an influencer, uh, there is a level of commitment to them as well. For example, if you start a campaign with them and um, you cancel before the influencer has created content. Uh, so, sorry, if uh, if you cancel right off the bat, like before there's an agreement in place, before like uh, before you approve them for your campaign, you get your full refund on that campaign. Uh, but if you accept an influencer into your campaign, and um, and you remove them after that, then you'll get seventy five percent of the back because we'll pay the twenty five percent to the influencers. Uh, if the influencers created content and submitted to you on the platform, and then you cancel it at that point, 
then you actually wouldn't get anything back because they've already done their end of the work, which is they've gone out and created content. Um, and that also applies to them. So um, influencers are also under a service agreement. And if they, um, if they went ahead and uh, canceled, like let's just say your requirements were four pieces of content and they only posted one and they're like, I just want to get paid for the one, they actually wouldn't. Like uh, you, um, the influencers only get paid when they finish the campaign. And so it's, we try to be very transparent with them. Uh, the service agreement, when you create your campaign, the service agreement is very clear. It outlines what the requirements are. This is what happens when you cancel it. Um, and so if an influencer leaves or doesn't want to, for example, this has actually happened before where uh, an advertiser wants the influencer to make an edit and the influencer doesn't want to make an edit, uh, then it's very simple, like the influencer doesn't get paid for anything. And so in that case, influencers can just go in. Most of the time they'll do it. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's how I would look at it. Thank you, that's awesome. I think I have gone through all the questions I've received. If I haven't, please let me know if I've missed your question or if I haven't explained it properly, don't be shy, let me know. It's sometimes hard to communicate questions over Zoom, over text, so please let me know. Um, oh, we have a couple more that just came in. Um, so if you're interested, who should you reach out to? If you're an Innovation Guelph client, please reach out to Mickey or myself, Jordan. Um, Mickey. Um, maybe can put our emails in the chat box down there so that you can have those um, and we'll get you set up with the um, promotion that we're offering. Um, if you are not an Innovation Guelph client, Mickey, I'm thinking they would reach directly out to Merritt and Bold. Yep. And his emails and the presentation slides that will be sent out um, in approximately 48 hours. And we have another question. Also, sorry, Jordan, they can also come to you and I, um, whichever okay. is fine, and then we can always pass them through. Yeah, it could be a good kind of conduit to all of that. That's fine. Okay, sounds good. Um, Umer, do I need a lot of followers on my Instagram before hiring an influencer? So how many followers do I need to have on my Instagram for my business page? Yeah, uh, so on your business page, it's not about the followers. It's about the content. So um, we were speaking with a client recently, which is like an automotive accessory brand and uh, they haven't posted on their Instagram since 2019, right? And so for them, we recommended to like get some of some recent content, maybe like six to eight new photos, get some, some of the audience re-engaged before running your campaign because what the influencers want to see is that your, your Instagram is alive and it's working and it's engaging. Or sorry, what? and then also the audience, when they're coming to your page, that's also what they want to see. So it's not like, uh, it's not about followers because we worked with some brands that were very new and had maybe a few hundred followers. Uh, and, and so, and those campaigns were successful as well. It just depends on uh, the content. So just making sure you have uh, an engaging account, it's, you're sharing content regularly. And by regularly, I mean at least like once a week. Um, and and just, just get that live for maybe a few weeks. And I think, then you could, you could be in a good position to explore that as well. Um, thank you. Um, I don't see anything else that's come in, Mickey, unless you wanted to jump in now. Sure. Just one sec, I'm gonna share my screen here. And uh, thank you. Amara, I really appreciate you coming and talking about Embold. And of course, the, the discount for the clients uh, will also be up on our website in the next few days. It's under our perks section. Um, slowly but surely, our website is getting updated. Um, so there's a new perk and resources uh, tab, and it will be appearing under there um, where you'll be able to click on it and, and, and be able to see uh, a little bit of detail about the um, about the the promotion that we talked about here today so let me just um get this up on my screen i want to um thank everyone for coming and spending the last hour and a half with us i really appreciate you uh you being here so um the 50 percent off platform like i said email jordan and i i dropped our email addresses in there we're also going to be putting in a link for 
a uh, feedback form. So we would really appreciate it if you could fill that out. That would be great. Give us your thoughts on today's session, but also if you have any ideas for any future sessions, then um, we would love to hear that as well. Um, these Toolkit Tuesday sessions happen on the third Tuesday of each month, and uh, we aim to find topics that interest you. So if you could let us in on what does interest you, then that helps us do our planning. So that would be fantastic. Uh, again, a really great thank you to Amar and uh, our, SLA, our SLEO interpreters, Laura and Danica, to our sponsors, to Jordan, uh, and to all of you for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thanks. Have yourselves a lovely one and wonderful afternoon. We hope that the snow doesn't come too much tonight. Um, and uh, the sun's shining pretty soon again. All right. So take care and stay safe, everybody.